their colleagues. The, the, the. Dear colleagues, can I ask you to take a seat, please? Please take a seat, dear colleagues. Once again, can I please ask you to take a seat? This is a very important moment for the Parliament. Good afternoon. We are here today in the dark shadow cast by Putin's war. A war we did not provoke, a war we did not start. An outrageous invasion of a sovereign, independent state. On behalf of the European Parliament, I condemn the Russian military aggression against Ukraine in the strongest possible terms and express my solidarity with all those suffering and all those killed. The message, the message from Europe is clear. We will stand up. We will not look away when those fighting in the streets for our values face down Putin's massive war machine. We will support the International Criminal Court's jurisdiction and the investigation of war crimes in Ukraine. We will hold him accountable, just as we will hold Lukashenko. We are facing an existential threat to the Europe we know. The Europe so many have given so much for. And this is why on this important day, I am pleased to announce that President Zelensky will address us shortly followed by Speaker Ruslan Stefanchuk, the Chair of the Rada of Ukraine. And allow me also to have a special welcome to the Ambassador of Ukraine and the Ukrainian people pre present in the plenary today.
Mr. President, thank you for showing the world what it means to stand up. Thank you for reminding us about the dangers of complacency. Everyday acts of extraordinary heroism by Ukrainians inspire us all. Defence forces and citizens making the ultimate sacrifice to delay a column of tanks. Senior citizens standing up to face down Russian troops with nothing but pride and sunflowers as their weapon. Brave women forced to give birth in metro stations next to their Kalashnikovs. They showed the world that our way of life is worth defending. It is worth a cost. All those who remember living under occupation will attest to that. All those standing up in Belarus, all those looking to us in Moldova, in Georgia. It is worth it for us, for the next generation, for all those in Ukraine and around the world who believe in Europe and in our way, and for all those who want to be free. Our European response was on display over the last very painful days. This must be our whatever it takes moment. Neighboring states have accepted hundreds of thousands of fleeing Ukrainians. Europeans sheltered Ukrainians in their homes. We have implemented a series of unprecedented, massive sanctions. We have gone further and will provide much needed weapons to Ukraine. We have declared that Russian aircraft and oligarchs' private jets are no longer welcome in our open skies. We have moved for Russia to be disconnected from the SWIFT system. We have banned, we have banned Kremlin propaganda tools. European citizens, organizations, businesses, sports have taken a clear and forceful stand, underlining that they will not deal with or welcome an aggressor. And Europe stands ready to go further still. We recognize Europe's, Ukraine's, European perspective. And as our resolution clearly states, we welcome, Mr. President, Ukraine's application for candidate status, and we will work towards that goal. Because we will. Because we will and we must face the future together. Mr. President, we stand with you in your fight for survival in this dark moment in our history. When you look to this European Parliament, you will always find an ally, a space to address Europe and the world, and always, always a friend. This European Parliament has a long, proud history of being a thorn in the side of autocrats. And in this spirit, I will seek a ban on any representatives of the Kremlin from entering European Parliament premises. Because aggressors... Because aggressors and warmongers have no place in the House of Democracy. Dear President, dear members, let me finish out by setting out four important principles for our future. First of all, Europe can no longer remain reliant on Kremlin gas. We need to redouble our efforts. <laughs> to diversify our energy systems towards a Europe that is no longer at the behest of autocrats, that will put our energy security on stronger footing. Secondly, Europe can no longer welcome Kremlin cash and pretend that there are no strings attached. 
Putin's oligarchs and those who bankroll him should no longer be able to use their purchasing power to hide behind a veneer of respectability in our cities, in our communities or in our sports clubs. Their super yachts should find no harbour in our Europe and we can no longer... And we can no longer sell passports to Putin's friends, allowing them to circumvent our security. No more. Thirdly, investment in our defence must match our rhetoric. Europe must move to have a real security and defence union. We have shown last week that it is possible and desirable, and more than anything, it is necessary. And fourthly, we must fight the Kremlin's disinformation campaign. And I call on social media and tech conglomerates to take their responsibility seriously and to understand that there is no being neutral between the fire and the fire brigade. President Michel, President von der Leyen, High Representative Borrell, thank you for ensuring European unity and commitment in facing this threat. I know that all of us, all the members of this House, will take the united message of Europe back to our constituencies. President Zelensky, thank you. We are together now. We will be together in the future because we are with Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear president in the media, in, the, in this session hall. You know, over the last couple of days, I don't know how to welcome and greet everybody because I cannot say good morning or can say good afternoon or good evening. And I cannot, and that's true, because every day, for some people, this day is not good. For some people, this day is the last one. I speak today now about my citizens, citizens of Ukraine, who are defending by paying the ultimate price. They defending freedom. I'm very happy that what I've seen here now and heard here now. I'm very glad to sense this mood, the uniting, unifying mood. I'm happy that we have unified today, all of you, all the countries of the European Union. But I did not know But this is the, that this is the price they will have to pay. And it's a tragedy for, our, for me, it's a tragedy for every Ukrainian, tragedy for our state. I mean, this, pri this high price, very high price. Thousands of people who ki were killed. Two revolutions, one war, and five days of full-scale invasion of the Russian Federation. You know, I am. I'm not. I don't read off the paper, off the sheet because the paper phase in, this, in the life of my country has ended. Now we're dealing with reality. We're dealing with killed people, real life, you know? 
And you know, I believe that we today we're giving lives for values, for rights, for freedom, for the desire to be equal as much as you are. We are giving away our best people, the strongest ones, the most value-based ones. Ukrainians are incredible. And very often we love to say that we will win ev over everyone. And I'm very happy that you are not only talking about it, but you can see that. And we indeed, we will overcome everyone. And I'm sure, I'm convinced, there is an expression, Ukrainian choice, Euro European choice of Ukraine. That's what we are striving for, and that's what we are going to, and we went to. So I would like to hear that from you to us, we could hear um, the, 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 that Ukrainian choice for Europe from you. I have, have a, some time off here because we have breaks between the missile strikes and bombardments. And this morning was a very tragic one for us. Two cruise missiles hit Kharkiv, the city which is located to the borders of the Russian Federation. There were always many Russians there, and they're always friendly. There were warm relations there. More than 20 universities are there. It's the city that has the largest number of universities in our country. The youth is bright, smart there. The people who gathered there all the time and was gathering there all the time for celebrating all celebrations at on the largest square in our country, the Freedom Square. And, and this is the largest square in Europe. And that's true. This is called the Freedom Square. Can you imagine this morning two cruise missiles hit this Freedom Square? Dozens of killed ones. This is the price of freedom. We are fighting just for our land and for our freedom. Despite the fact that all large cities of our country are now blocked, nobody is going to enter and intervene with our freedom and country. And believe you me, every square of today, no matter what it's called, is going to be called as today Freedom Square in every city of our country. Nobody is going to break us. We are strong. We are Ukrainians. We have a desire to see our children alive. I think it's a fair one. Yesterday, 16 children were killed. Again and again, President Putin is going to say that is some kind of operation and we are hitting a military infrastructure. Where are our children? What kind of military factories do they work at? What tanks are they going with or uh, launching cruise missiles? He killed 16 people just yesterday. <sighs> Dear Our people are very much motivated, very much so. We are fighting for our rights, for our freedoms, for life, for our life. And now we're, boring for, we're fighting for survival. And this is the highest of our motivation. But we are fighting also to be equal members of Europe. I believe that today we are showing everybody that's exactly what we are. The European Union is going to be much stronger with us, that's for sure. Without you, Ukraine is going to be lonely, lonesome. We have 
proven our strengths, we have proven that as at a minimum we are exactly the, the same as you are. So do prove that you are with us. Do prove that you will not let us go. Do prove that you indeed are Europeans and then life will win over death and light will win over darkness. Glory be to Ukraine. Thank you very much for your strength message, strong message, uh, President, for your bravery and for your conviction. Uh, I will now give the floor to the Speaker of the Ukraine Parliament, Ruslan Stefanchuk, for his intervention. First of all, I would like to thank you for the possibility to speak, to address the European Parliament. And I would like to say, look at my back. You see the shoots that every, everybody sees today, the whole world sees today. Eight years ago, Ukrainian people said categorically no to the Russian aggression, to their attempt to change their way to home, to European nation, to the United European Union, to, to a very successful unifying process that they demonstrated during all these years. Instead, our right to develop, our right to be a democratic state that chooses itself its own way was completely ruined by the country that doesn't respect international law, international principles, that destroys territorial integrity and sovereignty. And the result you see today very clearly, an amount of killed, amount of wounded. You know that the aggressor attacked Kharkiv full scale tonight. Today, other, other cities are being constantly under attack. You know, I think that in the history of Europe, there is a crossroads. Europe is now fighting aggressor. And it is very important how this challenge will be rebuffed by the U United Civilization. Dear, dear parliamentaries, I know that you will look at a very whole range of serious economic sanctions that you will adopt against the aggressor. I would like you to understand that today Ukraine is defending the border of the civilized world and God forbid Ukraine falls. Nobody knows where Russian aggressor will stop. I, you know, when I was in my official suit, 
and we were working in the parliament and we have been taking very important reformist laws but just today i was four times descending into the basement because because above my one and a half thousand old city there are bombs missiles and they do everything to break ukrainian spirit but this wouldn't happen so think think now what can happen to europe if if the russian horrible empire is renewed if the european union would be able to protect the space of freedom which was created during the last tens dozens of years and what is felt in eastern european countries now when russian tanks will confront their borders so, to which other regions kremlin will look uh, after it conquers ukraine that i would like to call upon you to think strategically to support the unity of european union to support ukraine to make it strategic partner and the most important act don't be silent collect all your efforts and show that europe today is unified as never because the threat today is like never before and the best support to the people of ukraine in these darkest hours will be the real uh, recognition of our European aspiration because the membership in the European Union even before these events that started uh, on the 24th of February was supported by the majority of Euro Ukrainians and this is our mandate this is our mandate to have relationship with you with the European Union because the Ukrainian people have done have made their choice and I'm calling upon the, all the member states and the leadership of European Union to support the candidate the aspirant status for Ukraine which is now supported by the whole of Euro Ukraines you know that Vladimir Zelensky has already signed the letter uh, with our application to membership according to uh, article 49 of european union uh, agreement dear friends in the project of the resolution of the european parliament there is a whole range of sanctions going to be reflected against the aggressor i would i call upon you to support them because let's together together we have but to confirm to confirm the churchill uh, ex expression about that there are no small people and no small countries let's we know that ukraine has proven that this slogan during the last six days let's be let's be worthy of those people who are perishing right now for the european union for the future of our european house let's understand that there cannot be peace in europe without ukraine there, there could not be integral europe without ukraine glory to ukraine thank you for your attention
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for your words, uh, for your courage and for your commitment to peace and parliamentary uh, democracy. I give the floor now uh, to the President of the European Council, Charles Michel, for his statement. Madame la Présidente du Parlement européen, Madame la Présidente... President of the European Parliament, President of the Commission, members of the European Parliament. Dear President of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, dear Speaker of the Ukrainian Parliament. The words that you have expressed pierce our hearts and our souls and show how serious the situation is. The challenge is a very serious one and the decisions that we're going to have to take together are also very serious ones because once again blood and war have reached European soil. Vladimir Putin launched a brutal, massive invasion of Ukraine, an unjustified and unprovoked war based on despicable lies, and he did it only for one reason. Because you, dear Vladimir Zelensky, you, dear people of Ukraine, in Maidan, you made the choice of freedom, democracy, and rule of law. And dear colleagues, it's not only Ukraine that's under attack. International law, rules-based international order, democracy, human dignity are also under attack. This is geopolitical terrorism, pure and simple. We must support Ukraine, and you are, we are supporting Ukraine. We must protect peace, we must protect democracy and international law. And ladies and gentlemen, our transatlantic alliance is strong, united, perfectly coordinated, and we are also working closely with the members of the G7 and with the United Nations, and more and more countries are engaging in an anti-war coalition along with people from around the world with one common message. One common message. Russia, stop the row. Go home. Let's talk. We are putting maximum pressure on Russia and its leaders. We are stepping up to support Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. I salute with all of you, President Zelensky and the brave people of Ukraine for their courage and composure. And it's also our duty to rise to this historic moment. Ladies and gentlemen, we promised together that we would react quickly, that the consequences for Russia would be massive and severe, and our actions have matched our words, we have responded with massive and unprecedented sanctions. We imposed sanctions on political and military leaders, on oligarchs, on Vladimir Putin, on Sergei Lavrov. We are also taking powerful measures to severely restrict the use of the foreign currency reserve of the Russian Central Bank. We are excluding key Russian banks from the SWIFT system. And we are also imposing severe sanctions on key sectors of Russia's economy. Mais, mesdames et messieurs, nous devons être... Ladies and gentlemen, we have to be honest about all of this. These sanctions 
will also impose a cost on us. And this is a price worth paying because what's at stake is our values, our convictions and our common future. Alors, chers collègues, bien sûr. Colleagues, obviously supporting Ukraine is mobilizing financial resources. That's what we're doing and we're going to continue to do. There's going to be an international donors conference. We also, together with our member states, be committed and engaged on the direct borders within Ukraine, with the Ukraine. We'll be helping refugees, people fleeing war and conflict, and we'll be showing our solidarity to the Ukrainian people and those who are mobilizing. But obviously, solidarity is also demonstrated via defensive military resources, which are being and will be delivered on. This was something that we decided on Saturday morning, together with the High Representative for Foreign Affairs, we decided to activate the peace facility with the support of member states so that we can support the purchase of these defensive military this defensive military equipment which is so crucial for the Ukrainian people now ladies and gentlemen a few moments ago president zelensky looked us in the eyes he opened up his heart and he has made an announcement which we've now received officially the request for the European Union to officially recognize Ukraine as a candidate country. It'll be up to us as a European Union to act in accordance with the times. It's going to be difficult. We know there are different views in Europe. There are various views on this subject and it'll be up to the European Commission to produce an opinion on the basis of which the Council will take its responsibilities on board. The Council will have to seriously look at the some symbolic, political and legitimate requests that's been made and will have to make the appropriate choices in a determined and clear-headed manner. Ladies and gentlemen, when this war was launched, Vladimir Putin thought that he would break European unity. He was wrong. He probably thought that he would face inertia, paralysis, the search for excuses to avoid taking decisions, but he was wrong. When he launched this action, he probably thought that he would take Ukraine easily and rapidly, but he was wrong because the Ukrainian people are resisting bravely. He probably thought that he would le launch a fatal blow against that which we incarnate, freedom and the rule of law. But again, he's wrong. And in 1961, General de Gaulle said that every retreat excites the aggressor. It makes him redouble his pressure and makes his action easier. Western powers can best serve world peace by standing up firmly against aggression. That's the position of President Zelensky, and that's the position that we have to adopt. We have to stand firm and look at the aggressor, and we have to see President Zelensky as the incarnation of stability, security, enlightenment, and European values. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, President uh, Bo uh, Michel. I now give the floor to the High Representative uh, of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, Joseph Font de Borel, for his statement. Monsieur le Président du Conseil européen, Madame la Présidente of the Européen, 
Dear members of the European Parliament, I will try to share with you my thoughts on the meaning of the tragic events that we are living and the provisional lessons that we can draw from them, especially for the common security and defence policy, which I have the honour to try to develop, and it remains an intergovernmental policy, a policy which is yet in the hands of the member states, but cannot be implemented efficiently without the strong cooperation of the Commission competences. I think this is the, the moment in which the geopolitical Europe is being born. This is the act of the birth of a geopolitical Europe. Once we are aware of the challenges that we face, the moment Europe must assume its responsibilities, the moment we become fully aware that for the first moment since the Second World War we are seeing one country invade another. This is a country with nuclear weapons. Uh, this is part of its intimidation tactics. It makes me sick when I think about the historical analogies and how we can look back at the events at the start of the Second World War. ...of tragedy to which Europe is being confronted today. The return of tragedy, far from frightening us, should galvanize us. First, because it believes the idea that the European project had lost its momentum because the horizon of the war has been faded. Unfortunately, not. This reminds us that the evil, the tragedy and the war never fade away. And it's about the relationship with war, with the use of force, with the violence, who have been debating here, we have been debating for years to find out can Europe can counter it. And this is why in the recent years we have talked more about defense issues than in the past, and we have begun to set up joint military programs. Well, that's why the European Parliament itself has voted to set this European Defense Fund, and the Member States has created this European Peace Facility that now we are mobilizing in order to provide arms to Ukraine. The European Council, in the next weeks, will adopt the strategic compass, and with the invasion of uh, Ukraine by Russia, we must amplify our reflection, adjust our means, and anticipate our responses. Because one of the lessons that we have to learn from the invasion of Ukraine is that more than ever, Europe must to think strategically about itself, its environment, and the world. This is not longer a luxury, it's a necessity. Europe must amplify its reflection on security issues, and the European Parliament has had an important role to play in this regard. We think we need to think about the instrument of coercion, retaliation and counterattack in the face of reckless adversaries, because all we need to understand is that to make peace, we need to be two. But to make war is enough to be one. This is exactly what Mr. Putin is telling us. And that's why we have to increase our deterrent capacity a lot. We need to increase our deterrence capacity in order to prevent war. And it's... <laughs> and it's clear um, that uh, our deterrence has not been strong enough to stop Mr. Putin's aggression. But since this aggression has started, we have reacted in the last few days in a way that Mr. Putin didn't expect. And we are showing him that we will never sacrifice our freedom and the freedom of others on the altar of our well-being and prosperity. Being president of this parliament in 2007, 
I had the opportunity to tell to Mr. Putin eye to eyes on the aftermath of the killing of a journalist, Anna Poliotoskaya. I told him, we are not going to change human rights by your gas. And this is the moment to repeat and to act on that. We will not share. We will not, we will not abandon the defense of our human rights and freedom because we are more or less dependent on Russia. And we have to start working quickly, as the Commission has proposed, in order to cancel this dependency. Last Saturday, after having held another Foreign Affairs Council and attending the debate of the European Union Council, I was talking with you, President Michel, and you told me, are we doing everything we can? Is there something more than we can do? Is that enough? Are, are we so, so powerless? And you told me, think, do, act. We have to push member states in order to adopt decision on shift and to take Russia out of the financial system. Think about how can we arm Ukraine, not country by country, one after all, in an incoordinated manner. And you encourage me to talk with member states again. In a few hours, we agreed on using this European peace facility in order to bring financial support and coordinate member states on arming Ukrainian army and people. In less than 24 hours, another taboo had fallen. And the president of the commission immediately showing a strong leadership and start working in order to get an agreement with our international partners in order to make possible to switch off Russia from the financial system. And you know what? Now, half of the reserves of the Central Bank of Russia are completely out of their control. They are frozen. Do you imagine? This is a coercion capacity. Three days ago it was impossible and now it's possible and they are start feeling the consequences in terms of inflation and the fall of their currency. Yes, we have capacities, we have mobilized these capacities and we have to continue doing so. Putting together the capacities of the member states and the European Union, I want to remember you that the European Peace Facility is not part of the budget that you vote is another budget, is an instrumental fund managed by the member states because we claim that we European Union with a peaceful force and we cannot provide arms to anyone else. Yes, we can. Yes, we have done. On the next budget, think about it. When you vote the next budget, use your budgetary capacity, you have the budgetary capacity of this institution to put the ways and means in order to face the next crisis and the next Russian aggression. We are also working we are working in the international arena to try and build a coalition to condemn the uh, to condemn Russia within the UN. They had no votes in favor and only abstentions. There were countries traditionally allied to Russia that did not vote in favor of them. They abstained. And so now we need to build an international coalition. So in the next UN General Assembly, it will be the entire world that will condemn this aggressor. Nobody can look the other way. There is no justification for a powerful country attacking its weaker neighbor. You cannot uh, speak of uh, pacifism. You cannot have the aggressor and the attacker on the same footing. We have to be by their side. We have used our coercitive capacity, not necessarily using weapons. When we talk about Europe being a hard power, people think only in military power, but there are other ways to exert hard power. Our coercive capacity 
is a way of influencing another's behavior. And this is not just done by weapons. It has been done by the European Commission and extraordinarily uh, successful uh, measures as put in place by the Commission. So thank you, President von der Leyen. We're not talking about mobilizing missiles, but these sanctions can have a hugely important effect on a country. They will not allow Russia to spend the money that we have spent on their gas to fund this war. That is, ladies and gentlemen, I believe the most important lesson that we can draw from these tragic circumstances. We cannot simply call for the rule of law and hope that our trading and commercial relationships will help move everybody towards a more democratic path. The forces of evil, the forces that want to use physical violence as a way to resolve conflict, are still there. And against these types of forces, we have to show a much stronger capacity to act. We need to be more consistent. We need to be more united than we have been up to now. We have done a lot. I think we have surprised the world. I think we have surprised Putin by our rapid capacity to act, and we must continue along this path. This moment here in Parliament, with your applause, that shows us that the EU institutions must continue on this path that we have started. This is the moment that Europeans understand they live in a dangerous world, and in order to confront that, we must have a stronger union. The pandemic has opened the door to innovative actions. It has helped us move along the path to greater unity when facing this virus. And now this tragic moment should give us fresh impetus to be ever more united and to counter these actions that threaten human life, security and the prosperity of all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, High Representative. I now give the floor to the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, for her statement. Madam President of the European Parliament, Mr. President of the Council, High Representative, Mr. President of the Ukraine, dear Volodymyr, Mr. Speaker of the Ukrainian Parliament, my honorable members, war has returned to Europe. Almost 30 years after the Balkan Wars and over half a century after Soviet troops marched into Prague and Budapest, civil defense sirens again went off in the heart of a European capital. Thousands of people fleeing from bombs camped in underground stations, holding hands, crying silently, trying to cheer each other up. Cars lined up towards Ukrainian western borders. And when many of them ran out of fuel, people picked up their children and their backpacks and marched for tens of kilometers towards our union. They sought refuge inside our borders because their country wasn't safe any longer. Because inside Ukraine, a gruesome death count has begun. Men, women, children are dying once again. Because a foreign leader, President Putin, decided that their country, Ukraine, has no right to exist. And we will never, ever let that happen and never, ever accept that. Honorable members, this is a moment of truth for Europe. And let me quote the editorial of one Ukrainian newspaper, the Kiev Independent, published just hours before the invasion began, and I quote, this is not just about Ukraine. It's a clash of two worlds, two polar set of values, end of quote. They are so right. This is a clash between the rule of law and the rule of the gun between democracies and autocracies, between a rules-based order and a world of naked aggression. How we respond today to what Russia is doing will determine the future of the international system. 
The destiny of Ukraine is at stake, but our own fate also lies in the balance. We must show the power that lies in our democracies. We must show the power of people that choose their independent path freely and democratically. This is our show of force. And today, a union of almost half a billion people has mobilized for Ukraine. The people of Europe are demonstrating in front of Russian embassies all across our union. Many of them have opened their homes to Ukrainian fleeing from Putin's bombs. And let me thank especially Poland, Romania, Slovakia and Hungary for welcoming these women, men and children. Europe will be there for them, not only in the first days, but also in the weeks and months to come. That must be our promise altogether. And this is why we are proposing to activate the temporary protection mechanism to provide them with a secure status and access to schools, medical care and work. They deserve it. We need to do that now. And we know this is only the beginning. More Ukrainians will need our protection and solidarity. We are and we will be there for them. Our union is showing a unity of purpose that makes me proud. At the speed of light, the European Union has adopted three waves of heavy sanctions against Russia's financial system, its high-tech industries and its corrupt elite. And this is the largest sanctions package in our union's history. We do not take these measures lightly, but we feel we had to act. These sanctions will take a heavy toll on the Russian economy and on the Kremlin. We are disconnecting key Russian banks from the SWIFT network. We also banned the transaction of Russia's central bank, the single most important financial institution in Russia, and this paralyzes billions of foreign reserves, turning off the tap on Russia's and Putin's war. We have to end this financing of his war. And second, we target important sectors of the Russian economy. We are making it impossible for Russia to upgrade its oil refineries, to repair and modernize its air fleet, and to access many important technologies it needs to build a prosperous future. We've closed our skies to Russian aircraft, including the private jets of oligarchs. And make no mistake, we will freeze their other assets as well, be it yachts or fancy cars or luxury prosperities. We'll freeze that all together. And thirdly, in another unprecedented step, we're suspending the licenses of the Kremlin's propaganda machine. The state-owned Russia today and Sputnik and all, as their, and all of their subsidiaries will no longer be able to spread their lies on to justify Putin's war and to divide our union. And these unprecedented actions by the European Union and our partners in response of an unprecedented aggression by Russia. Each one of these steps has been closely coordinated with our partners and allies. The United States, the United Kingdom, Canada and Norway, but also, for example, Japan, South Korea and Australia. All of these days you see that more than 30 countries representing well over half of the world's economy have also announced sanctions and export controls on Russia. And if Putin was seeking to divide the European Union, to weaken NATO and to break the international community, he has achieved exactly the opposite. We are more united than ever and we will stand up in this war. That is for clear that we will overcome and we will prevail. We are united and we stay united.
Honourable members, I am well aware that these sanctions will come at a cost for our economy too. I know this, and I want to speak honestly to the people of Europe. We have endured two years of pandemic, and we all wished that we could focus on our economic and social recovery. But I believe the people of Europe understand very well that we must stand up against this cruel aggression. Yes, protecting our liberty comes at a price, but this is a defining moment, and this is the cost we are willing to pay, because freedom is priceless, honorable members. This is our principle. Freedom is priceless. Our investments today will make us more independent tomorrow. And I'm thinking first and foremost about our energy security. We simply cannot rely so much on a supplier that explicitly threatens us. And this is why we reached out to other global suppliers and they responded. Norway is stepping up. In January, we had the record supply of LNG gas. We're building new LNG terminals and working on interconnectors. But in the long run, it is our switch to renewables and hydrogen that will make us truly independent. We have to accelerate the green transition because every kilowatt hour of electricity Europe generates from solar, wind, hydropower or biomass reduces our dependency on Russian gas and other energy sources. This is a strategic investment. And my honourable members, this is a strategic investment because on top Less dependency on Russian gas and other fuel, fossil fuel sources also means less money for the Kremlin's war chest. This is also a truth. We are resolute. Europe can rise up to the challenge. The same is true on defence. European security and defence has evolved more in the last six days than in the last two decades. Most member states have promised deliveries of military equipment to Ukraine. Germany announced that it will meet the 2% goal of NATO as soon as possible. And our union, for the first time ever, is using the European budget to purchase and deliver military equipment to a country that is under attack. 500 million euros for the European Peace Facility to support Ukraine's defense. As a first batch, we will now also match this by at least 500 million euro from the EU budget to deal with the humanitarian consequences of this tragic war, both in the country and for the refugees. Honorable members, this is a watershed moment for our union. We cannot take our security and the protection of people for granted. We have to stand up for it. We have to invest in it. We have to carry our fair share of the responsibility. And this crisis is changing Europe. But Russia has also reached a crossroad. The actions of the Kremlin are severely damaging the long-term interests of Russia and its people. More and more Russians understand this as well. They are marching for peace and freedom. And how does the Kremlin respond to this? By arresting thousands of them. But ultimately, the longing for peace and freedom cannot be silenced. There is another Russia besides Putin's tanks. And we extend our hand of friendship to this other Russia. Be assured, they have our support. Honorable members, in these days, independent Ukraine is facing a darkest hour. At the same time, the Ukrainian people are holding up the torch of freedom for all of us. They are showing immense courage. They are defending their lives. But they are also fighting for universal values, and they are willing to die for them. President Zelensky and the Ukrainian people are a true inspiration. 
And when we last spoke, he told me again about his people's dream to join our union. Today, the European Union and Ukraine are already closer than ever before. There is still a long path ahead. We have to end this war and we should talk about the next steps. But I am sure nobody in this hemicycle can doubt that a people that stands up so bravely for our European values belongs in our European family. And therefore, honorable members, I say long live Europe and long live a free and independent Ukraine. Mezvame slava Ukraine. We are with you. Glory be to Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President von der Leyen. We now move uh, to the speakers on behalf of the political group, starting with Manfred Weber for the EPP group. The 24th of February significant date in Europe and the world. War has returned to Europe. And of course, it seems what we're doing here it hardly measures up to what the Ukrainians are now doing. So right now, we're focusing on our ad admiration for the Ukrainians with their president leading them, their, their strength, their love of liberty, the decisiveness. They are the heroes of the European way of life. The 24th of February, is a day of freedom for Europe, from Dublin to Athens, from Lisbon to Riga. And the same feeling of shock everywhere, dismay with this aggression. At the, at the, on the other hand, ad, admiration for the people of the Ukraine. They're fighting for us, they're fighting for our values. These days, this Kyiv moment of the 24th of February makes everyone European. This moment forces us to give clear answers. When President Zelensky asks us, are we welcome? May we become members of the EU? Do we belong? Then I say on behalf of the largest party of Europe, yes, you are welcome. Yes, you belong to the European Union. You are friends. This Kyiv moment forces us to look at the alternatives. Putin is the brutal aggressor. He represents the opposite of our convictions for nationalism, for autocracy. This brutality of trying to have imperial influences, the opposite of us. We want to conquer borders and have, demonstrate respect to everyone and defend our democracy and defend our freedoms. This Kyiv moment also means we have to be honest. We have to make it clear that we have to take action. With these sanctions, we have an exemplary package. I'd like to thank everyone for the last day's work. We, as a group, we support these measures. But one thing is very clear, a few days ago, a week ago, we didn't really hear the same words. Some people. Uh, we're refusing to talk about North Stream 2 as a possible sanction. We weren't decisive enough. So today, that means we have to take action and we have to really abolish this unanimity in foreign policy. This Kyiv moment also means a strong NATO, but it also means a strong European pillar. And the EPP visited NATO troops in Lithuanian, and I asked uh, the commander, what's your greatest wish? And we say 50% of our time is to deal with the technical differences among, uh, for example, the, the radios and the equipment. What we need is a European structure. That's what they were asking for us, those people who are now s defending Europe. This key moment means we have to think big as Europe. So this 
conference on the future of Europe has to be rethought. We've concluded our citizens dialogue. Now it's the right time to make this conference a genuine place to decide about the future of Europe, to have the courage together. And if we don't do it now, when are we going to do it? And this key moment demonstrates to us that we have to really look at the policies we're deciding. Energy policy, as Mrs. von der Leyen just said, we have to speed the energy transition up. We have to have new trade partners, new agreements on energy. Our Kyiv moment means for us that we are together bound to the U.S. With Joe Biden, we have to use this moment. It demonstrates how important it is to have uh, how decisive our trade partners are for free freedom and democracy. We have to have a new free trade agreement with the U.S. to demonstrate this. It's the right time, this key moment, to look at the future development of Europe. We're, a new age is dawning. We need endurance, but the European way of life is worth it. Freedom has no price. The price of freedom is something you pay when you lose it. And the Ukrainians are demonstrating that today. And we stand with you, Ukraine. Thank you, President Weber. I now give the floor on behalf of the SD group to Irache Garcia Perez. Gracias, Presidenta. Thank you, President. Putin's war against Ukraine marks the beginning of a new stage in Europe and in the world. These are historic times and we need historic decisions. Financial and military support to Ukraine, deconnecting the main Russian banks from the SWIFT platform, the activation of the International Protection Directive to assist Ukrainian refugees and banning the Kremlin's media machine are all part of a qualitative leap in our capacity to respond. Western democracies have achieved an admirable unity to face this challenge, and it's crucial that we maintain our unity given the serious challenges that we will continue to have to face. The four sanctions packages headed by Mr Burrell are the first step in a long crisis that will raise new dilemmas. For example, how to continue to support Ukraine or how can we react to probable Russian reprisals? Unity requires courage and sacrifice. It's only with courage and sacrifice that we can achieve the energy independence that we need to defeat Putin. Our utter co uh, commitment to a global energy order that's based on renewable energies over the long term needs to be complemented, complemented with the creation of strategic reserves of gas for the short term. We also need carried courage and sacrifice to welcome all the refugees who are fleeing war. We need shared responsibility there. The cowardly attack of Putin shows his real fear, which is democracy. A successful democratic transition in Ukraine needs to serve as an inspiration to those who bravely have taken to the streets in Russia. The fight for peace and freedom of the Russian and Ukrainian peoples require our support. We cannot rest until Putin is judged as a war criminal by the International Criminal Court. Putin's attack will also reveal his accomplices from the extreme European right and a model of living together which rep of life which represses the opposition's censors the media and denies individual rights. Currently in the cities and towns of Ukraine, it's not only their security and territorial integrity that's at stake, but the world in which we want to live. It can be a democratic world based on international law, diplomacy and human rights, or it can be a different world based on brute force, spheres of influence and violations of rights that should be universal. No tyrant will make us renounce our desire to forge alliances that are based on peace, which protects the sovereignty of nations, progress, 
freedom and the integrity of our borders. History is never wrong. We can't leave Ukrainians alone as the Spanish felt during the first half of the 20th century in the fight between fascism and democracy. The resistance of the heroic Ukrainian people will be the triumph of Western democracies. And let me just conclude with a personal comment. I'm proud of Europe, the Europe of today, the Europe that does not resign itself to what's going on, Europe that looks back to learn from history, but above all, looks forward to defend what we hold most precious, democracy and peace. Thank you. I now give the floor on behalf of the Renew Europe Group to Stéphane Sajonet. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you very much, Madam President, Mr. President, High Representative. Let me start by welcoming the courage of the Ukrainian men and women who are fighting not just for their country, but their right to choose their own destiny. President Zelensky and the President of the Ukrainian Parliament, you are heroes of democracy. The European Parliament today has shown it is a strong ally of the Ukrainian people. Europe is a shield that protects its democracy and freedoms for all the peoples of Europe. Of all the decisions taken this week, let me just say you have the absolute support of our political group. There is huge work that has been done by the European institutions in order to put in place and make operational these sanctions and support measures for Ukraine. Alone or divided, I can't even imagine what Putin would have done to our continent. You have been up to this historic challenge. Let me go even further when it comes to support measures for Ukraine. I believe giving the candidate status to Ukraine is important. Now, of course, it will take some time for the Ukraine to join the EU. There will be a rigorous process, but I think it's important that we acknowledge that the Ukrainians are fighting for democracy. They are already part of our community. I think the status of candidate country would be a fair acknowledgement for this. We expect to see strong sections to really dry up all of the financial resources for Putin in this war. Technological embargoes, gas, oil against the oligarchs as well, an end to the golden passports and residence rights, as you have mentioned, Madam President. All of these sanctions must be activated as soon as possible. We hope uh, that this will not hit the Russian people too hard, as we know who are majoritarily opposed to this war. We need to welcome the Russian opposition here in this hemicycle as well. Now, these measures will have a cost for our economies, so we need to mutualize costs at a European level for the countries and companies who are hardest hit by this. Let me conclude with one final point, uh, Mr. President, Madam President, to say that there is still some work to be done for Europe to guarantee its solidarity as shown by this crisis. Our journey towards strategic economy needs to include a review of the defence budget at national and European levels, as well as an energy autonomy strategy as well. Colleagues, the protection of our European model comes at a cost. My political group believes that our freedoms are a fundamental value. We are willing to assume that cost when it comes to sanctions or investment in tools of European sovereignty. We understand sacrifices of the uh, European people and also the sacrifices of millions of Europeans before us who have made this the freest continent in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I now give the floor on behalf of the Green Group to Philip Lambert. Dear Ukrainian friends, we do not have enough words to praise your courage and determination to defend your freedom. Your resistance is a wake-up call to all Democrats around the world. 
without the will to fight, democracy will perish. To your aggressor, I say, your lies for justifying war cannot and will not remain unchallenged. No, Mr. Putin, Ukraine is not ruled by Nazis. On the contrary, its legitimately elected president stems from a family who was blooded in the Holocaust. No, Mr. Putin, there's no genocide going on in the Donbass. What is happening there is a war that you yourself started eight years ago, which took already 14,000 lives, and that your invasion brings only to a new level. No, Mr. Putin, Ukraine has never intended to get nuclear weapons. On the contrary, it relinquished voluntarily those it inherited in 1991 from the Soviet Union in exchange for its territorial integrity, which you have been trampling on ever since you, uh, you annexed Crimea in 2014. No, Mr. Putin, there was no perspective for Ukraine to join NATO in the foreseeable future. And if there is such an aspiration in Ukraine, as there was in so many nations once subjugated by the Soviet Union, your aggression against Ukraine explains why. No, Mr. Putin, the NATO member states have no intention to deny the Russian people's right to peace and security. It is your reckless actions that imperil those legitimate aspirations. The reality, Mr. Putin, is that the people of Ukraine chose for freedom, for democracy, for rule of law, for peace. And that choice, made by a people so close to Russia's by history and geography, was never a threat to Russia's security, but to the very existence of your authoritarian and kleptocratic rule. This is the real reason for the invasion, at the cost of precious human lives and livelihoods, both Ukrainian and Russian. The reality, Mr. Putin, is that your brutal aggression against the Ukrainian people is doomed to fail. You wanted to deny their very existence as a people, your aggression in cementing their unity against the invader. As citizens of the European Union, we know that the war on Ukraine is more than a, just an aggression against a sovereign state. It is a direct challenge to the values that lie at the foundation of our union. Ever since it was started, the European project was and remains a peace project. So that the rule of brute force be replaced by the rule of law. So that democracy, dialogue, compromise and cooperation across national borders provide the best basis for shared and sustainable prosperity. We Europeans cannot stand by idle when a partner country is invaded and when our fundamental values are challenged in such a brutal way. This is why, short of direct military intervention, which would be foolish, we must and we will provide the Ukrainian people with all the support we can in order to face the aggression. This is why we must and we will provide safe haven without any discrimination to all those who are fleeing the war to seek refuge on our territory. This is why we must and we will mobilize all political, economic and financial means at our disposal to exert maximal pressure on Putin's Russia in order to make him stop his aggression. And let me be clear to the people of Russia. We have no quarrel with you. You too have the right to live in dignity and many of you are standing up daily to defend it at great personal risk. We know that resuming the diplomatic dialogue with your country is the only path to a sustainable peace on our continent. But this can only happen if the aggression stops. As for us Europeans, meeting the challenge put to us by Putin's war will test our strength, our determination, and above all, our unity. It will not come cheap. Therefore, it will force us to make hard choices. The first must be for cohesion within and across member states. The global financial crisis, the Eurozone crisis and the pandemic have deepened social and economic injustice in our union. It cannot be that once again the brunt of the massive efforts required to counter Putin's war will be carried by the weaker shoulders. Should that be the case, the legitimate resentment would sap the very basis of our social contract as well as those of our union. And this would fulfill 
one of Putin's unset goals, dividing us. The second must be for energy independence. Indeed, our massive dependence on Russia for raw materials and energy is a primary reason for Europe's lack of determination to deter the, re the Russian regime up until now. No surprise, when 40% of our gas, 30% of our coal, of our oil, and of our nuclear fuels, don't forget that, is provided by Russia. As the EU is almost devoid of these resources, is our plan really to replace this massive dependence from Russia with another equally massive dependence from anyone else? We say that energy independence is the key for the EU to become a respected geopolitical player. And that will never be achieved by putting gas and nuclear at the heart of our energy strategy. As the President said, only renewables and energy efficiency can give us the strategic autonomy we seek. It is not just for the climate that we must accelerate the energy transition. It is for our security and for the resilience of our economies. The colleagues, never before has the European Union been challenged in such a direct and brutal way. I have no doubt that we collectively, and only collectively, have the strength, the resources, the determination, and above all, the wisdom to meet this challenge, together, together with Ukraine, because we belong together. Thank you. Thank you. I give the floor now to Marco Zanni on behalf of the ID Group. Grazie mille, Presidente. Thank you, President, President of the European Commission, President of the Council. Hi, Representative. The cowardly attack of the Russian regime is showing Europe once again the ugliest images of its history, as uh, was recalled by President von der Leyen 30 years since the war in the Balkans. Once again in 2022, we're talking about a war in Europe. Our support and our extraordinary admiration goes to the Ukrainian people, these people who are tenaciously defending their freedom and their sovereignty when faced with an unacceptable attack. It's great to see unanimous criticism of the attack and it's great to see that perhaps the, for the first time European Union institutions have firmly and rapidly responded to an emergency situation. Everyone's recalled the sanctions package that has been launched and in terms of size, length and impact it is unequalled in European history. The approach and the unity with which the European institutions have moved are unprecedented. Support for the Ukrainian people needs to be total and we need to ensure that we have peace as soon as possible, a peace which restores the territorial integrity of Ukraine. But at the same time, as some of you have recalled, we also need to look at the fact that the 24th of February has changed our history. There's going to be a before the 24th of February and an after the 24th of February. And we have to look at what our errors and mistakes have been in the past. What has led to us being unprepared for a post February the 24th period. Russia isn't the only authoritarian regime that is threatening the global order. And that's something we need to note. So let's try and look at these errors that we've made. We've several times mentioned our dependence on Russia in terms of energy, gas, oil, raw materials. And they're also a market for our goods. But this dependency was our political choice. We chose not to use our own energy resources and to buy them from Russia or elsewhere instead. Europe is not 
a country, well, an area, excuse me, that is poor in energy resources. That's something we've chosen to be. Let me give you an example. In the 1990s in Italy, we were producing 20 billion cubic meters of gas a year. Today, we produce three, not because gas in Italy has run out, but because we've decided not to use it. And on sanctions, as we've said, this package is unprecedented. But we have to be clear, it's going to have an impact on our economy as well. And let me take up what our colleague Mr Lambert has said. We've had two years of pandemic, we've had an unprecedented economic crisis, and we can't have the consequences of these sanctions weighing on our businesses and on our citizens. So I hope that the Commission will act quickly once again to ensure that this doesn't happen, to ensure that our businesses and our citizens receive the appropriate support. Let me conclude just with a couple of comments. Firstly, what we've seen happen with Russia needs to be a lesson for the future. There's another non-liberal regime that's threatening the West, and that is China. Let's not make the same mistakes with China that we made with Russia. Let's reduce Europe's dependency on China. That is crucial. My second point is more personal in nature, and with this I will conclude. These are times of history in which politicians are split between the great and the less great. In my country we say men and small men. And once again I note that unfortunately at this time some people in this parliament wanted to see themselves recalled as small men. They prevented my political group from fully supporting the resolution that we're going to be voting on. And this is something that is a small gesture that, ju that, that doesn't damage my political group, doesn't damage others. I think it damages this institution, which could have assumed a unanimous position. Thank you. Give the floor next on behalf of the ECR group to Mr. Legutko. Uh, Madam President, uh, the war, the war uh, created an entirely new situation and we have to do everything we can to win this war because it's our war, the war of all European nations. Once Putin decided to go ahead with the invasion, it became clear he is determined to subdue Ukraine and will not hesitate to resort to the extreme measures. It was he who once said, let me remind you, that the collapse of the Soviet Union had been the greatest geopolitical tragedy of the century. So there should be no misunderstanding as to his intentions. He plans to create what was once the Soviet empire, perhaps not with one stroke, but that is definitely his final objective. Moreover, uh, he, was, he has been uh, more or less open about it all along. The Ukrainian army uh, and the Ukrainian people are opposing the invaders and they, need, they desperately need some military backup arms and other tools of defense. Fortunately, after the initial uh, opposition from some countries, um, nowadays it is about uh, 20 governments, I think, that started helping the Ukrainians. And it's very good that uh, some time ago in the Council, the member states decided to create European peace facility and that these funds can be now used to help Ukraine. And I'm proud to say that it is my government that was first to propose as early as Thursday morning to activate European Peace Facility. So the flow of arms, 
the flow of uh, necessary technology and other means of defense must continue. Whatever the effects of the sanctions, who will win the war will be ultimately decided on the battlefield. <clears throat> And, and finally, I must say this, I'm sorry I must say this, because as usual, uh, the EU is uh, with its uh, narcissistic and self-congratulatory proclivities, likes to escape uh, responsibility. Putin made his decision because he was induced by the weakness of the West. Let us be frank, he did not think much of the Western leaders, and it showed he didn't hide it. And in a way, he was right, having been for a long time pampered by the French and German governments, by some American administrations, also by the European Commission that was both unable and unwilling to stymie the Nord Stream projects. To those Western leaders and governments that took upon themselves the job of dealing with Russia, particularly to the German politicians, but not only to them, we must say today, ladies and gentlemen, you blew it and your leadership credibility is gone. It's time for a reset and let us start and let us start by enabling Ukraine to join the European Union. I give the floor next uh, to Manon Aubry on behalf of the left group. Madame la Présidente. Madame. President, Madam President of the European Commission, war has come back to Europe. I am part of the generation that was born after the Cold War that did not know this clash of the big powers. I have been told since childhood that Europe is peace. However, the ghosts of the past are coming back to haunt us. War is back. And let me say very clearly, Vladimir Putin is entirely responsible and today he has blood on his hands. Our group firmly condemns the unacceptable military Russian aggression against Ukraine and would like to highlight the heroic resistance of the Ukrainians and their presidents in the face of this invasion. The tanks are rolling in, the bullets are raining down, S terrified civilians are trying to find shelter whether in the underground or on the road to exile and it's those people I'd like to think of first and foremost. The Ukrainians need to know that we are not going to abandon them. Let me say to President Zelensky that I very much thank him for taking the time today to speak to our parliament. Democracy and freedom, those things that his people are fighting for, these are our values too. They are the antithesis of Putin. We need to urgently send humanitarian assistance without any conditions. We need taking refugees without any distinctions of the color of skins, with no uh, but, with no arguments. The humanitarian crisis is also geopolitical. Putin wants to take us into a world of chaos and brutality where the strongest prevail. And I say this very seriously. Colleagues, President von der Leyen, President Michel, we cannot accept to become part of this terrible game and for Europe to become a battlefield. I warn you, colleagues, against becoming involved in military one-upmanship and an arms race that would turn our continent into fire and blood. As Jean Jaurès rightly said, you cannot wage war to end war. The European Union must, however, defend at any cost the only really valid objective, and that is peace and de-escalation. Strong and targeted sanctions have been taken, but for some of them, how will they be truly applied when there is still impunity for tax havens which hide the wealth of Russian oligarchs? 
we need to uh, tackle uh, tax evasion and criminality at an international level, we should be clear these economic sanctions can only last so long. The people will feel the consequences through price rises that will have to be compensated. We all know that the only really sustainable option is diplomacy. All of our efforts have to be focused on obtaining a ceasefire and seeing the withdrawal of Russian troops. The way to the path to peace is difficult, but it is the only reasonable path we have. NATO a military alliance, a legacy of the Cold War, is not the solution. NATO does not judge on world peace. That is the United Nations. The place to discuss the security of the continent is not NATO, it's the OSCE. The Ukrainian president has talked about ways to move forward. For example, a statue of neutrality protected by the United Nations. We should support this possibility. I don't want to lie to the citizens. There is no miracle solution. But I do have a very firm conviction what we need to do to counter Putin is not to enter into a vicious cycle of eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. What we need to see is the mobilization of people for poor, uh, for peace. In Russia, at Rostov Solodon, there was a young woman who was imprisoned for uh, eight days simply for standing in the street with a placard. And that is a symbol for the mobilization that Putin wants to try and make invisible. She symbolizes the courage of thousands of Russians who are defying the fierce repression of Putin. There are hundreds of thousands of European uh, who have taken the Ukrainian flag and gone onto the streets to call for peace, peace at any cost. And let me uh, end with the words from uh, Albert Camus on the 8th of uh, August 1945, just after the bombing of Hiroshima. Looking at these terrifying perspectives for humanity, we see now that peace is the only fight that is really worth fighting for. It is more than a prayer. This is a call from the people to their governments. It is a choice between hell and between reason. Thank you very much. On behalf of the non-attached members to King Agal. Madam President, Mr. High Representative, until last night more than 90,000 uh, refugees arrived to Hungary. This is the biggest humanitarian program in Hungary in history uh, and we are trying to help everybody who wants to come to Hungary. Everybody is welcome, everybody will be helped irrespective of which part of Ukraine they are coming from and irrespective of their ethnicity. The entire country has mobilized, has been mobilized to help them. Uh, the military aggression... Uh, we fully condemn the military aggression against Ukraine. And we stand for the territorial, territorial integrity of Ukraine and the sovereignty of Ukraine. We are in favor of a united European action and we also uh, are in favor of uh, Ukraine's candidate status. And despite all the disinformation, we support all common suction, sanctions, common decisions, also the European peace facility should be activated. We must not let ourselves be drawn into this tragic war just on the other side of the border. Ethnic minorities are even more vulnerable in war than in peace times. We must pay attention to the security of the ethnic Hungarian um, community in Transcarpathia. We need calm, we need wisdom, and we need the two parties to engage in talks again. We need to restore peace. Uh, in the neighborhood, and we must help Ukraine in any way we can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now the next speaker is Mrs. Junke Chetena. Ukraine signed in their blood the EU membership. I myself must apologize the Ukrainians and all others that I was too weak to convince my friends in the West in time that Putin is a major threat 
And then the biggest provocation is not our NATO or EU memberships, but not being invited in joining NATO and the EU. But today there are no more Eastern or Western Europeans. There is only our joint responsibility for European continent. I want to turn to the Russians. You also can stop the war criminal Putin. I understand that you yourselves are imprisoned and poisoned with lie. But join us nonetheless. The Ukrainians are dying for you also, for a free Russia. Some human being in the Kremlin must act too to isolate this war criminal with a nuclear button in his hands. Those maps who went to the occupied Crimea must now go to Putin and stop him. Ukrainian blood binds you. We are witnessing the beginning of an end for Putin. When that end will come, I cannot tell you. I only know that we must do all that is in our power to bring it closer. Thank you, Ukraine. Slava Ukraini. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Petro Markus, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Vice President, Madam President, and High Representative. Barbaric aggression against a free country in Europe, and of course, we're all united. It reminds us of the Cold War. This war is not an illusion. A, a people is suffering. Yes, for the Ukraine, we have to have unprecedented, unprecedented sanctions against Russia and his oligarchs. We have to liberate Ukraine from Putin. And we also have to see that Putin is trying to kill people if we don't react today then we won't have the possibility of remaining united as a union. We have to work and express our solidarity and maintain our autonomy in the world. And we have to leave this crisis unified. We have to do this for the children and do this for the children of the brave and courageous Ukrainians. Yeah, colleague. Thank you very much. Mr. Artovitschus is next. Mr. Chair, Madam President, uh, High Commissioner, dear colleagues, dear Ukrainians, today we are back to 28 in the European Union again. Ukraine has emerged as a great member of the European family. Ukraine is bravely fighting for European values and freedom for Europeans. Let us give Ukraine its due. Providing a candidate status now and then accepting it in the European Union. Every day that passes makes things worse for Ukraine and we cannot allow it. Today the future and the fate of Europe is at the stake in Ukraine. Russia's traitorous operation only confirms the Putin's regime's choice to draw new red lines on the face of Europe. By ordering the attack on Ukraine, the Russian leader Putin has become a war criminal and has brought the Belarusian dictator Lukashenko with him. They are already in the dustbin of history. Their actions are already condemned and soon be to be convicted. Let us give Ukraine a weapon with which it can defend itself against the aggressor. It's our duty. And let us provide humanitarian aid to its people who are suffering from the crimes of its aggressor. The support must be such that the West can look Ukraine in the eye. Let us isolate Russia, the full political, economic, and cultural blockade. Keep Russia down, Kremlin cronies out, and the Russian people close. Ukraine's victory is our victory. Slava Ukraini! Now, 
Next speaker, Mr. Sergei Lagodinsky. Slava Ukraini! We did not ask for this confrontation. Ukrainians did not ask for this confrontation. Ukrainians didn't spread hate. Ukrainians didn't dream of empires. Ukrainians did not dictate their neighbors what policies to follow and which alliances to join. Ukrainians did not occupy, did not annex and did not blackmail. Those actions came from Moscow. And my heart is bleeding when I say those words. But Ukrainians, all they want is to live a free life in a free country. This is not much to ask, but this is a lot to defend. And this is why it is our European moral imperative to help. To help Ukrainians with refuge and money, but yes, also with military equipment. To help them defend their own choice, to help them save their children, their families, their loved ones, the loved ones who take arms and walk to battles. Help them to return. And yes, this is why we have no other options than to put a clear alternative in front of President Putin. Either you stop this war now or you will have to bear the consequences that will be devastating. We did not ask for this confrontation. You did. Kollege Kofel. Mr. Kofel, next speaker. Thank you very much, Vice President. Russia has to be hit by the hardest sanction sanctions. We have to send weapons to Ukraine. We have to send money. We have to send humanitarian aid. And we have to receive those poor people who are forced to flee Ukraine, who are now arriving in our home. We have to say no to Putin's regime. And we have to demonstrate that the aggression that, that Putin has demonstrated towards a peaceful neighbor is unacceptable that this action will, we will respond with serious consequences and the Kremlin's terror will never be tolerated by the free world. The free world can only be on the side of Ukraine. I love Europe because of its diversity. And Ukraine is part of Europe. The people who are fleeing, fleeing from the Ukraine, they are Europeans and they are part of our European family. The Ukrainians are being attacked by Putin, and so therefore we should demonstrate our friendship and help. Dictatorship can never succeed, and Putin will never have enough. Right now, it's impacting Ukraine. In the future, it could be affecting other European countries. We have to say stop. We have to stand up and we have to be alert and ensure every country's right to determine on its, its own destiny. We have to be prepared to defend ourselves against any tyrant who will attack us with terror and war. We need strength in NATO and we need larger defense budgets. I support this resolution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. After the cleaning is Mr. Fitta. Thank you, President, uh, President of the Commission. This is an unacceptable tragedy. What's happening in our continent in front of our eyes, just a few kilometers away from our borders, is an attack being carried out from the Russian Federation on the territorial integrity and sovereignty of a democratic country. The images that come from Ukraine show that the attack is indiscriminate and unacceptable, but also show, show clear violations of international law. We need to act to put an end to these actions which are aimed at 
women and children, civilian populations. This is not war, this is barbaric, and those who are responsible need to be judged for their actions. These are barbaric actions against the European, uh, the Ukrainian, excuse me, people. We salute their bravery and their resilience. I think it's important today to emphasize that the actions and role of the countries on, U on Ukraine's western border are crucial. They're carrying out very important humanitarian work. We need to work together with NATO and other countries across the globe in order to defend the values of freedom and democracy. And it's because of that that the European Union and the West, who have made mistakes in the past, need to stand firm and together today. Our group fully supports the sanctions and any actions that will strike at Moscow's military and economic power. We want to see Moscow forced to end this shameful conflict in Ukraine. We also need to be aware that in preserving political unity, we need to work hard to ensure that public opinion is with us and th the people of Europe are going to suffer given that this is coming on top of the pandemic and economic crisis. So we need a fund to provide funds to citizens who are struck by this by these sanctions thank you okay. thank you very much the next speaker is mrs villanueva Ruiz. Gracias, Presidente. Presidenta. thank you very much president let me say that we firmly condemn the invasion by putin and we want to show maximum solidarity to the victims in Ukraine in these very difficult times. It's also important to remember that today there are extreme right groups in this chamber who are allies of Putin and who have helped finance and work for the destabilization of Europe. And this is not something we can continue to hide. Europe needs to act firmly and with the objective of building peace, the priority has to be to stem the loss of human lives. This conflict uh, cannot be used uh, to further other interests. We need to foster spaces of international dialogue. We need to use all the tools we have at our disposable, disposal to promote that dialogue. We know that that is the only way to end this terrible tragedy. Let us not repeat old uh, errors and see military escalation, which will lead to years of pain. This is the uh, moment to be uh, involved in uh, politics and show that Europe is up to this challenge. Peace is the only objective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frau Kollegin. Thank you much indeed. Now I'll give the floor to Mr. Castaldo. Thank you, Chair. Today, we are not simply condemning an unjustifiable aggression. Today, we stand up united in this House to face the criminal invasion of an authoritarian regime against international law, our principles, our values, therefore against all of us. Putin's cynical bet assumes he would quickly overthrow the Ukrainian democracy with his divisions on the ground, but also brings other divisions, no less dangerous, through propaganda and fear within our countries among our peoples. Our bond and duty is to make sure that it will fail, with our resolute support to the heroic resistance in Ukraine and its official recognition as EU candidates, and with the immediate adoption of a new solidarity package based on common European bonds. We must immediately support also our companies and families who will suffer the dire consequences of the dutiful sets of sanctions aimed at bringing Moscow to the negotiating table. This is not the war of all the Russians. This is a crime perpetrated by a tyrant and his accomplices. Thousands of citizens are bravely taken to the streets to shout their clear no, risking their lives to oppose his imperialistic ravings. They deserve our full support. This existential threat is a crucial moment in our history and calls for exceptional efforts if we really want to protect peace, democracy and our common destiny. Sometimes it takes courage to grow up and become who we really are. Slava Europa, Slava Ukraina!
Unser nächster Re Thank you much indeed. Mr. Gala, please. Frau Präsidentin, die President, colleagues, Slava Ukraini. What's happening is war in Europe in real time. Suffering innocent people is the biggest catastrophe for Ukraine since 1941 when Germany invaded. And the only responsible is a cynical, lying dictator who rejects the uh, existence of Ukraine as an independent state and wants to bring his people back into the empire. This must fail. 1948, beginning of the Berlin blockade. Ernst Reuter, then Berlin mayor, spoke to the world and he said, revisionist Russia is trying to do the same thing now in Ukraine to to put the Ukrainian people into their guardianship. Peoples of the world in America, in Europe, in the free world, look at that city, look at that country and understand that that country, that people cannot be left behind. This people and has said where it wants to be we need to give that people a political signal that they belong to us that uh, their fight for freedom isn't in vain that this evil this stalinist fascist putin regime will not be victorious and after all of this is over they can start reconstruction on a path to europe so i would ask for your approval of this resolution slava ukraini thank you Herr thank you very much mr gala next we have mr piccola Hola. thank you yes the aggression of Russia against Ukraine can be the beginning of the end of humankind, but it could also be the beginning of a new world order. The main reason for the war is the authoritarian rule of Putin. Which is worse, Putin's aggression or his narrative justifying violence? Putin counted on Ukraine's passiveness and the division of the West, but he overestimated his strength and underestimated the Ukrainian resilience and the ability of the West to come together. This war reminds me of the military aggression against my country, Croatia, 30 years ago. Attacks on children, civilian buildings, destruction and refugees. Just as Milosevic did, Putin must answer for his actions before the International Criminal Court. Putin will find it difficult to come out of this war. Kremlin might experience the Russian version of the Maidan. History has shown that dictators can be vanquished, but it is equally important to eliminate the circumstances leading to their rule. Ukraine will bleed, but Putin's Russia will bleed out. Glory to Ukraine and Slava Ukraini. Next, we have Natalie Loiseau. Il a fallu une guerre. It took a war. It took a war on European soil for Europe to learn to speak the language of power. It took Vladimir Putin and his war too far for the transatlantic ties to retighten, for NATO to wake up and for European defence finally to emerge. But it took, above all, the extraordinary courage of Vladimir Zelensky and the Ukrainian people for us finally to feel obliged to try to rise to the occasion. Let's not fool ourselves. The crisis will be a long one and it will be tough. We will have to hold strong to pay the price of our decisions and, above all, to go further in strengthening our union. 
at the Maidan in 2014. It was a European flag that was flourished by the Ukrainians to call for the end of Moscow's dominion. Today, in the shelters where they seek shelter from the bombs, the European flags can still be seen. We are the ones the Ukrainians are looking to. We must prove to the Ukrainians that they are right to believe in us. We must love Europe as much as they love it. Slava Ukraini. Merci, madame. Thank you very much indeed. Vice President Heidi Hautala, please. Arvoisa puheenjohtaja. President, the attack on Ukraine has finally meant that we have shown our unity and that we've shown global leadership. That's what we've needed. I think we've been able to show that our strength now has been brought to bear to support Ukraine. Sauli Niinistö, the Finnish president, said that the masks now have fallen. All we see now is the face of war. What we see now is a very uh, difficult uh, development that we've seen happening over many, many years. We'll need to therefore work as the EU, as member states, and help our neighbours. We can't, oh, in Finland, in a non-aligned member state, we were frozen, if you will, but now we're actually seeing possible that we might be in the same situation. Countries that put themselves in Russia's way, uh, this happens to them. So they, we would line out to look for NATO. Kollege Bardella. Thank you much indeed, Miss Bardella. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, President. Negotiations were underway more than ever, but Vladimir Putin took an unacceptable step, putting Europe under the scourge of war. The sovereignty of a people and country was violated. So solidarity with the people of. Ukraine. They've entered into a resistance to defend their homeland. But uh, the tragic lessons of history must not cloud our vision. We need to look at the complexities as we seek peace and de-escalation. For 20 years now, we've been moving in a direction that has taken us under the American flag, and we have an imbalance in our relationship with Russia. Our own freedom to act has been sacrificed to an illusion and an archaic conflict. We need to be firm and we need to be unambiguous in our unity and our support for the people of Ukraine and our condemnation of this invasion. It is nonetheless dishonest for the EU institutions to make use of this to take a vision of federalism forward that the people of Europe reject. NATO, an expansion of the EU won't help in any way. The priority is to stop the arms. Russia should not come back to uh, face a kind of sanctions which have not uh, helped. Undermining the purchasing power of the people who are already suffering doesn't help with the strategic autonomy. And the sanctions which have been in place since 2014 have been in this case. We should not carry on using methods which we condemn elsewhere in Europe. Uh, mature democracies such as our uh, shouldn't be closing down media stations, even if they're under a foreign influence. It is also uh, uh, no point of fanning the flames of war. We need to seek peace and de-escalation, and we also need to return to a free, independent, respected France, which is uh, able to operate in a balance in a multipolar world. Frau Anna Fotiga, the floor is yours. Thank you, President. Uh, I salute uh, heroism and, and uh, resistance of Ukrainian people. 
uh, facing the unprecedented aggression from uh, the Kremlin, Putin's uh, Russia, Russian Federation. Uh, I really admire heroism of Ukrainian leadership. President Zelensky already finds his place in universal history. I admire heroism of commanders, soldiers, and in particular, ordinary people. You are invincible. It is our war as well. And in, the, in resisting aggression, you are the best part of us, the West. Uh, we are honored by your request to become a member of the European Union. We'll do our utmost to provide you candidacy status as soon as possible and immediately uh, on uh, un unprecedented uh, uh, rules, the, the membership, therefore, because we need you. And of course, you need us. In this, uh, I speak on, on behalf of entire ECR, Polish delegation, all of them fully support the resolution as negotiated by me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Mr. Pineda Nano. Thank you, President. We condemn the Russian invasion of Ukraine. No nuances. Not eight years since Donbass, we've seen impunity of the various assassinations by these gangs of Nazis. The Minsk agreements haven't been uh, f adhered to, but nothing can justify this attack. We're against war. And that's why we cannot support this resolution calling to arms, and which refers, which says that it's a guarantee of peace uh, and refers to an instrument of war, which is NATO. And the sanctions that are against the civil population, well, never in the whole history of uh, conflicts has san have sanctions helped anything. A fund to support peace cannot be used to buy weapons. We defend diplomacy, politics as the only way of resolving the conflict. We defend the sending of humanitarian aid and opening the borders for those refugees from that war. Our Secretary General Julio Anguita said, may wars be damned and the swines that support them. Thank you. Kostas Papadakis is next, please. Our condemnation of the capitalist aggression of Russia combines with the condemnation of the war crimes of the US, NATO and the European Union against the peoples of Yugoslavia, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria and Libya. The imperialist competition for spheres and influence and natural resources led to the capitalist war, which is paid with human lives and poverty. Uh, all this 30 years after the capitalist restoration of the Soviet Union, that socialism made it for people to live in equity for decades. Now armaments are paid by the people and this leads to escalation of the imperialist war with the deep intervention of Greece through NATO bases. Peoples do not choose sides, no intervention, no involvement in the war, no armies outside national borders, decoupling from the EU and NATO. People in power. Thank you. Thank you. Antiros Kubilius, you have the floor. Dear brothers and sisters in Ukraine, dear colleagues, first of all, I would like to praise heroism of Ukrainian people. I would like to praise heroism of Ukrainian soldiers and the heroic leadership of President Vladimir Zelensky. 
Ukrainians are facing and defending themselves against a the war launched by real new Nazi regime in Kremlin. Putin is a real war criminal. Ukrainians are suffering because we in the West till now were too weak to stop Putin crimes from the very beginning. Ukrainians with their blood are fighting for their right to reunite with Europe. They are more Europeans than many of us. That is why we need to give them candidate status immediately, and then we need to design special, fast procedure for, Ukrainian, for Ukraine to join us. There is an example of such a special procedure when in 1990 Eastern Germany integrated into the European Union, and it took less than one year. So let's establish a special procedure also for Ukraine's swift reunification with Europe. After you started to deliver weapons to Ukraine, when SWIFT and other banking sanctions were introduced, we need next steps. First of all, we need to stop imports of Russian oil and gas immediately. Each day, we are paying to Putin for 100 new T-72 tanks, twice more than Ukrainians are able to destroy during one day on the battlefield. Second, let's create a multi-billion free Ukraine fund to support resilience, reconstruction and modernization of Ukrainian economy. Let's finance it in the same way as we finance Next Generation EU Fund with CU borrowing in the markets. Thanks, Jose Borrell, for a good idea. Said, let's introduce full-scale SWIFT and other sanctions also against criminal Lukashenko and his banks. And the last point, stable peace on the European continent will be possible only if deputinization of Russia will happen. With the help of Ukrainian victories on the battlefields, with our sanctions, and with the help of ordinary Russians protesting on the streets, the Putinization of Russia is coming closer and closer. Mr. Putin, you lost this criminal war. International Tribunal in Hague is waiting for you, for justice to be served. Justice, first of all, to Ukrainians. Razum do perimogi. Slava Ukraini. Thank you, Herr Kubilius. Thank you, Mr. Kubilius. Mr. Sven Mixer, please. Colleagues, I am proud at how strong and united we are today, but we have to be honest. We have been painfully slow and painfully late waking up to the true nature of Putin's Russia. I hope that today we finally truly understand the urgency and the existential nature of the current situation. If we do, it is imperative that we support Ukraine in every way possible without holding anything back. This includes lethal defensive equipment, economic and hum humanitarian aid, help to the refugees, and yes, also launching an honest and accession process for Ukraine to join our union. Regarding sanctions on Russia, for as long as the criminal ideology of Putinism remains in power in Russia, we have to go beyond punishing individuals and take the strategic decision of systemically weakening Russia's economy and industrial base. This is in our vital security interest. Yes, sanctions hit ordinary Russians too, and they are not our enemies. But let's admit it, it is primarily the responsibility of the Russian people to make sure that their mad Tsar cannot kill innocent people abroad. We should fully expect and, when possible, encourage the Russian people to take that responsibility seriously. Slava Ukraine. Next, we have Malik Azman. Thank you, uh, President. Um, the courageous Ukrainian people are standing up to an evil act of aggression. Europe answers Ukraine's call for help. We rise up to defend those who are fighting for freedom and democracy. The EU is showing unity, and we are finally showing that we are not just a soft power. We are crippling Russia's economy, isolating Putin's regime, and reinforcing Ukraine's defense. But this is just the start, and we have to do more by excluding more Russian operators and banks from SWIFT, by blocking the Russian central bank's use of Western currencies, and we should even consider blocking Russian ships in our harbors, and more. Also, we have to increase our support for Ukraine's economy and defense with money and weapons. My message to the Ukrainian people 
Europe stands with you. Slava Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Yannick Jadot, please. Monsieur le Président, chers collègues. President, colleagues, at this very time, in the streets and in the houses, the Ukrainians are heroically defending freedom. They're defending their democracy, their territorial integrity. They are for Europe as a whole. They're doing this for peace, security and democracy on our continent. So yes, let's massively sanction Putin and the oligarchs and immediately incorporate Belarus into those sanctions. Yes, of course, let us militarily support the resistance in Ukraine. Yes, let's recognize the candidate status for the European Union of Ukraine. And let's exclude Russia from the entire international community and launch a major investment plan for climate and energy security to create uh, renewable energies at the heart of the plan because they are the energy of peace and let's get out of the political complicity that is killing democracy and killing the climate let's act now let's be proud of europe alongside the resistance the heroic resistance of ukraine slava vilnia ukraina thank you Thank you. Mr. Uri, you have the floor. Dear Direction of the European Union colleagues, before I will say a couple of words uh, about Ukraine, I would like to ask you a couple of un honest questions. Where were international sanctions when the United States killed 200,000 civilians in Iraq under the pretext of um, uh, weapons of mass destruction? Where were your resolutions when the US, completely against the international law, bombed Yugoslavia, Libya or Syria? Where was Europe when uh, Ukrainian mercenaries were killing uh, children in Donbas or were burning civilians in Odessa? I hope that the actions of the last days are teaching us that all wars are bad. All wars are bad, not only the wars of the Russian Federation, but also the wars of the United States of America. We have to condemn all wars. What's happening in Ukraine is horrible and it has, has to stop. It has to stop. But the hypocrisy of some of you colleagues who ignore wars only because uh, they are American, that's also hypocrisy. It's terrible. I'm, I'm brought to next. Anu Danjan is the next speaker. Colleagues, the events we've seen affecting all of the rules in such a brutal fashion against all rational thought, we've seen deliberate aggression, brutal aggression against a free sovereign European nation. And Vladimir Putin is the only one that to be, to be blamed. By doing that, he underestimated what the Ukrainians could do. He underestimated how they felt about their independence. That's what all autocrats think. He underestimated the reactions from Europe. Ukraine, Ukrainian resistance is admirable and it needs our 100% support. We're very happy that Europe has taken its responsibility, shouldered its responsibility but this satisfaction, working in unity, that shouldn't affect our lucidity. This terrible war will last. The aggressor may actually win militarily, even though it has a lack of morality. Let's not forget either that given there is war in Europe, and we've had wars since 1945 in Europe, we've seen already that Europe believes that it's ready to deal with these wars. Since 1991, we saw a decade of terrible wars in the Balkans. 
Now we are moving to the Ukrainian theater. It is protecting more than just its status as an independent state. It's trying to, we have to make sure that we maintain our uh, strategic awakening. We have to deal with the situation that others are imposing on us. This is an existential threat. Thank you. Merci, monsieur. Thank you much indeed. Next, Mr. Benifei. Grazie. Thank you, President. There is no greatness where there is no truth. These are the words of Leo Tolstoy, as quoted by David Sassoli a few months ago, addressing Putin. And we need a truth again today to achieve peace. The truth of the Ukrainian people who've shown heroic resistance together with President Zelensky. The truth of a Europe which is finally fighting for its own political energy and defence sovereignty and which is not afraid to speak out and to make sacrifices, to speak with one voice to stop war and save human lives because victims come first, dead Ukrainians come first, the refugees we have to welcome and those brave Russians who are sick of this military folly also come first. All people should be free, including Ukraine, to make their own decisions, make their own choices without others trying to take uh, decisions on their behalf. So we give full support today to the defence of our own democracy on Ukrainian soil. But we should be even braver than that. We should be there. Our governments, the EU institutions, should take delegations to Kyiv to talk, to call for a ceasefire and to support the negotiations. Putin must stop. And then it will be all too clear to his own citizens, too, that both he and this inhuman war are mad. Long live free Ukraine. Long live free Europe. Thank you much. Grazie. Mr. Getter, please. Vous avez perdu, Monsieur. Mr. Putin, you have lost. Now, of course, you will continue to kill and destroy and to cause mourning and suffering, but you have already lost because you cannot rebuild empires, believe a Frenchman, and that absolutism uh, will not last either, believe a Frenchman again. Now, Ukraine is resisting heroically and magnificently and will do till its righteous victory. The Union has tightened its ranks now that now is uh, taking the hopeful step to a political union and you've brought the two sides of the Atlantic together. So you've lost, Mr. Putin, because your people no longer believe you and will not accept you going to massacre their Ukrainian cousins. You're just a war criminal, Mr. Putin. You're also an absolute menace to your very own country that you have led into a corner against its wishes. Long live peace, long live Ukraine, long live freedom, Mr. Putin. No. Yes. Thank you very much. Before we the Aussprache fortsetzen. Before continuing the debate, I'm now going to give the results of the first round of voting from the day. Please uh, uh, be understanding of that to the next speakers. So the results of the voting round are as follows. On the amendments on Russia's aggression against Ukraine, paragraph one adopted, paragraph two adopted, paragraph three amendment four rejected, paragraph three accepted, amendment five accepted. S uh, 22, 23, 24 rejected. Amendment 7 adopted. 29 part 1 adopted. 29.2 rejected. Amendment uh, 29 part 3 adopted. Paragraph 15 part 1 and part 2 and part 3 and part 4 adopted. Amendment 8 adopted. Paragraph 16 
amendments part one, two, three, four and five fall. Paragraph 17 adopted. After paragraph 17, amendments 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 adopted. 15, 16 and 17 rejected. Uh, paragraph 18, part one, part two adopted. Paragraph 19, Amendment 9, rejected. 19, Amendment 12, and 19, 25, adopted. On paragraph 19, parts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, they fall. Paragraph 20, part 1, adopted. Paragraph 20, part 2, adopted. 21 amendments on part 1, 2, 3, 4 adopted paragraph 22 part 1 and part 2 adopted on 23, 1, 2 and 3 and amendment uh, 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 part 3 also adopted on 24, 11 is a Adopted on 24 part 1 and part 2 they fall 25 adopted 27 adopted paragraph 28 parts 1 2 3 adopted paragraph 29 parts 1 and 2 adopted paragraph 31 amendment 26 is rejected on 31, part 1 and part 2 are adopted. 34, amendment 27, rejected. 34, part 1 and part 2, adopted. 35, parts 1, 2 and 3, adopted. Paragraph 36, amendments 19 and 18 are rejected. After 37, amendment 21, adopted. Paragraph 39 adopted. Paragraph 40 parts 1 and 2 adopted. After 43 amendment 10 adopted. After paragraph 44 amendment 20 rejected. After paragraph 45 amendment 28 adopted. Recital C part 1, 2, 3 and 4 adopted. After recital D, amendment 1, rejected. Amendment 2, adopted. After E, amendment 3, rejected. Recital F, part 1 and part 2, adopted. Recital G, parts 1 and 2, adopted. We shall now continue with our debate and I'd like to ask our colleague... Miroslav Radakovsky to come up to the lectern, please. <coughs> Dear colleagues, I am the only deputy from the European, of the European Parliament that comes from Eastern Slovakia. Uh, my friends and relatives uh, close to Ukrainian border offer a great help uh, to refugees running from the war, and they really condemn this war between two Slavic nations. The Slovak Parliament also condemns the unjustified uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and calls for immediate stop of this aggression. Slovak Republic has offered the Russian uh, and Ukrainian uh, representatives of uh, Bratislava for uh, peace talks. Uh, Slovak Republic uh, uh, does not agree with the um, new independent uh, countries. So Slovakia does not also uh, uh, Prove the Kosovo status because uh, this was also with the help of foreign uh, troops. Uh, I believe that uh, in the near future uh, there will be f peace between two Slavic brothers, Ukraine and Russia, and we will do everything to so that it will be this way. Thank you. What no Thank you, and I now give the floor to our colleague, uh, Mr. Halitsky. 
Szanowni Państwo. Ladies and gentlemen, children have been killed, women have been killed, towns have been destroyed. People there are fighting for us, for freedom, for their freedom, but also for our values, European values, democracy. They're fighting for us, for Polish people, for Lithuanians, for you, ladies and gentlemen, in Western Europe for all Europe to be able to enjoy security. They need weapons, that's obvious. But we can give them a lot more than weapons. We can give them a guarantee that once, thanks to those weapons, we've, they've reconquered their freedom, they can live in peace in our family, in this European family. And that should be happening as soon as possible. Without looking at the procedure, we will find a way of implementing that dream. dream. But let's be careful as well. Let's not make mistakes. If, if we want to suspend Nord Stream 2, why not suspend Nord Stream 1? We need to cut the head off Mr. Putin's mafia. We need to make sure they have no revenue. They should be there in The Hague International Tribune for war crimes. And we should hand our, uh, put our hand out today to everybody dreaming of peace. That's the sort of Europe we want. Europe living united and in peace. And anybody against that is working for Putin. Didn't start yesterday, this war in Ukraine. In 2008, let me just remind you, Russia attacked Georgia, uh, Moldova, Transnistria. Uh, blood was shed then as well. So we have to be supporting those in Russia who are fighting for peace for Mr. Navalny. Long live free and democratic Ukraine. Thank you. Mr. Yenskaya, you are the next one. Thank you very much, President. I'm grateful for this special sitting because it provides an opportunity to express what the political message of the day must be. We condemn the breach of international law uh, committed by uh, Putin ordering the invasion of a peaceful neighboring country. And that's the resolution uh, that we tabled as the SPD and we emphatically support it. Schultz is right, this is Putin's war and we are protesting against him, not the Russian people. Our thoughts are with those people in Ukraine now who are fighting for their freedom, who are losing their lives, and who are fleeing to save their lives. Slava Ukraini. The EU and its institutions in this opportunity have shown that they can rise to the occasion and there is an unprecedented uh, resolve that they have demonstrated. The EU foreign policy therefore works only when member states want it. The sanctions are hitting hard. Many European uh, politicians warned uh, Putin about how costly an attack on Ukraine would prove and that is being borne out now. Support for the refugees is continuing and we are showing solidarity with the countries on the western border of Ukraine who are providing the first assistance. They are not standing alone. Our help for Ukraine and neighbouring countries require us to develop our policies for further. How do we create security in a multipolar world? That question is one asked of us brutally by President Putin. We must find an answer. Thank you, colleague. And the next speaker is Mrs. Hilda Feldmans. High representative, colleagues, Peter's got, Putin has got what he wanted, more NATO, more European unity, more Western determination. And he really wants a dirty war, Putin, against the West, and now he's threatening with nuclear weapons. Everything is irrational. He's a warmonger. But let, let us not forget, colleagues, autocrats throughout the world are looking at what's happening, how we are going to protect our values. How they're looking at our reaction today, and that will decide which world we live in tomorrow. 24th of February, the world changed. Let's make sure 
that in this crisis we see a new Europe born, a strong European defence, a strong European army to defend our values. Where we work together, we have a common asylum policy to be able to deal with the refugees from Ukraine. A Europe that is no longer dependent on Russia for the supply of its fuel. A Europe with European Solidarity Fund for all Europeans who are affected by Putin's war. That is the Europe that we need now. Long live freedom, long live Europe. Slava Ukraini. Thank you, Frau Kollegin. Thank you. And the next speaker is the chairman of the Foreign Policy Committee of this uh, Parliament, Mr. David McAllister. Mr. President, thank you. The Russian military aggression and invasion against Ukraine is illegal, it is unprovoked, it is unjustified. This is indeed a crucial and historical moment, the moment of truth, as Commission President Ursula von der Leyen pointed out. Too many times in the past, the international community has been blind in front of unfolding tragedies. Today, we as a European Parliament are sending a strong and a united message to the Kremlin that we stand with Ukraine in full solidarity. As Chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, I would like to thank the colleagues from the different political groups who drafted and negotiated this resolution, and I call on colleagues to vote in favour. I fully underline the very good arguments we have heard today. I want to add one point. Let us also strongly condemn the involvement of Belarus in this aggression against Ukraine. It was during last week's interparliamentary conference on the CFSP and CSDP in Paris that Svetlana Tsikhanouska made it very clear that the assault on Ukraine wouldn't have been possible if dictator Lukashenko wouldn't have had provided Russia the land and the infrastructure. The Lukashenko regime has assisted and enabled this Russian aggression. For this reason, the EU should apply further appropriate sanctions also on Belarus. Dear colleagues, the world will hold Russia and Belarus accountable for their actions. Thank you. Thank you, Herr Kollege. Thank you. And now Mrs. Kathleen van Brems has the floor. Thank you, Sean. Dear colleagues, um, today we feel sadness, anger for sure, but also pride. Pride in the unity of the European response to uh, Putin's war crimes. Could you imagine just for one second that we did not have the European Union today? Then we would be divided and divided we cannot have any response to Putin. But united as we stand today, we have Ukraine's back. Mr. Zelensky, I know you have other things to do, but you know we have your back. We stand with you, we stand with your people in full solid solidarity, in fight for peace, freedom and democracy. And it is clear Putin will only listen to clear messages. So we need to, to use this clear language. So that, therefore, I think it's important that we stop buying gas from Russia. We need to cut up from that gas. It's at a high price, but it is doable. And if we do not pay the price today, we will be presented with uh, the price tomorrow. And President Zelensky was right. He said this is the crisis of freedom and democracy. Well, dear colleagues in Europe, let's take this fight and stand up for our values. Thank you very much. Merci, madame. Colleague. Thank you, Mr. Ilan Kuchuk. Thank you, dear president. Dear colleagues, we have a war in Europe on a scale and of a type we told belong to the history books. And let me be clear, this is not the war of Russian people. This is the Putin's war. Putin's regime is the one to blame for wagging the war, killing civilians, destroying 
conscious infrastructure. Putin has attacked democratic values and European aspirations of the people of Ukraine. But the brave Ukrainians stood up strong, and they deserve fully fed support. Colleagues, it's time to be on the right side of history and to grant Ukraine with candidate status. Dear Ukrainians, we will not, you, we will not let you go. I'm sure that the white will win over the dark. We are with you, the brave people of Ukraine. Slava Ukraini. Thank you, Herr Murisan. Thank you, Mr. Murisan. You are our next speaker. Thank you, President. Now is the time for actions and clear words, so I will say four things very clearly. We can only live in safety and security within the borders of the 27 member states of the Union if we are surrounded by countries which are safe and stable in our neighbourhood. This is why defending Ukraine means defending the European Union. We have to provide all support that we can to Ukraine, including financial support, and here we, the European Parliament, have a big role to play. We say very clearly we are ready to spend EU money to support Ukraine and to rebuild Ukraine. We are ready to spend EU money for defence. We are ready to spend more for democracy in Ukraine and everywhere else where needed as well. Secondly, when people in Ukraine say they want to join the European Union, our answer is yes, you are welcome. Ukraine belongs to Europe, Ukraine belongs to the European Union. This today we say with the very large majority of pro-European members of the European Parliament. We know there is still a lot to do until membership, many difficulties to overcome. But what proof do we need more than what the people of Ukraine are doing these days as a proof that the people of Ukraine can overcome all the difficulties in view of becoming a member of the European Union one day, we start work on this as soon as possible. Thirdly, the Republic of Moldova, a country of less than 3 million people, a neighbouring country of the European Union, has welcomed more than 70,000 refugees on their territory in the past five days. They provided food, they provided uh, shelter, they provided support, they acted in European spirit on the basis of European values because they are led by a pro-European president and a pro-European government. This is why I say everything that we offer to Ukraine, we have to offer to the Republic of Moldova right now in terms of EU cooperation, in terms of perspective for membership. The Republic of Moldova and Ukraine are equally important for the security of Europe. And last thing, the invasion of Ukraine and the assault upon Kiev would not have been possible without Belarus. This is why all political measures that we apply upon Russia, we should apply in the same manner upon Belarus. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to what came in. Thank you, Mr. Robert Biedron. Wojna wróciła do Europy. To wo War has come back to Europe. And this is a war between two worlds, authoritarian world and our world, where you want peace and democracy. It's a war perpetrated by Putin, and the heroes of the war are the Ukrainians, men and women. It's not just about aggression against Ukraine, it's aggression against the whole of Europe, all of our dreams of peace and our peaceful ambitions. That's why today we should remember that Europe will never be at peace until Ukraine is at peace. Ukraine is part of Europe. It's that is this, this, it's a moment of um, uh, it's a moment of hope for millions of Ukrainians who are placing that hope in the EU. We should be opening our doors wide for Ukraine before Putin closes his on them forever. I would ask every member here, every lover of democracy, to show their support for Ukraine. They're fighting for their freedom. Ours and theirs. Slava Ukraini. To what committee has Mr. Cholos Dacian? Mr. Dacian Cholos has the floor. Citizens of Ukraine. 
the citizens of Ukraine have the courage to stand up to one of the biggest armies in the world, and successfully so. They have the courage to fight, but also not to give up on the values of freedom, which are also the values of the European Union. This is a lesson for any tyrannical and criminal regime that wishes to abuse European aspirations and value, democracy and the freedom to choose one's future with blood and bombing. But colleagues, this lesson for the citizens of Ukraine is also a lesson for us. Those who have fought, those who have taken hold of freedom and peace in recent decades. Our lesson is that we must have the determination and courage to open today the path to our union to all those Europeans who want to join in this project, who believe in it. And fear not, just as they are standing up to a great army today, so they will have the strength to rebuild their country after this disaster. The Ukrainians deserve the EU opening the door wide for them. The same applies to Moldovans and Georgians. The Commission has taken courageous, historic steps in recent days, and this should continue. United we are a great power, and this can also be seen through the help given by the citizens of Romania, Poland, Hungary and Moldova and Slovakia to the refugees from the war. The countries that have opened their borders for refugees urgently need our support, and th that must uh, come. Slava Ukraina. Thank you. Uh, previous uh, president and current chairman of the Constitutional Affairs Committee, Antonio Tajani, has the floor. Mr. President, we are all Ukrainians. Tutta l'Europa. The whole of Europe, the whole of the West. We're on the side of freedom and democracy. We will continue standing up against Russian aggressors and stand up with the strength of our own values. The cohesion and the resistance that we've seen from the Ukrainian people and the strong role of Europe have forced Russia to sit at the negotiating table. We all want peace. Let us hope that the negotiations will lead to attaining fundamental aims such as peace. But peace cannot mean colonization of a free country. Many citizens of Ukraine are fleeing war. And we need humanitarian corridors with a refugee reception plan. We also need to take account of the events of the last few days and respond by having a true foreign policy and a true common defense policy. We need Europe to be even stronger in order to defend our values. We also need energy self-sufficiency. We need a single market for energy. For, we need a single market for energy. If we're really to uh, avoid being held hostage by any third party, and we also need solidarity. We need to help families and businesses. They've been mobilising enthusiastically in favour of sanctions and uh, willing to pay that price. But we need to ensure that we're helping those brave business people and families, we need to help them over the next few months and years because it is true that f freedom and democracy do come at a price. The price of our commitment, but our commitment has no price. We need to help those who have fought with such determination. Thank you. Helen Thank you, President. Commissioner, High Representative, we've seen war in Europe. Bombs are falling. Civilians are dying. Children are crying. Houses are collapsing. Putin's invasion can only be described as a, an invasion in cold blood without any regard for human suffering. The EU is more united than ever and we are adopting the harshest sanctions in the history of the EU. President Zelensky 
the people of Ukraine must understand that the EU stands with them. We show solidarity. Putin will see that uh, there is powerful, tangible action to stand up to him. The EU is speaking with one voice, once and for all, and this aggression against Ukraine must cease immediately. We must immediately step up to defend Ukraine and to defend the EU. The Swedish flag has the same beautiful colours as the flag of Ukraine, and we stand with the people of Ukraine. Thank you, Madam President. We've all seen how the unjustified, unprovoked aggression by the Russian Federation on Ukraine has caused a humanitarian disaster on a large scale. As we speak, thousands and tens of thousands of women and children and elderly people are trying to save their lives, crossing the borders. Uh, these people are entitled to their lives and civilized lives, the right to survival. Uh, people have mobilized governments uh, and citizens in Romania. They're doing what they can, providing food and shelter. It's a tragic situation. And uh, we've seen what absolutely deplorable conditions are experienced by these people who've lost their homes. For example, a woman who crossed the border with a small child in uh, their hands, uh, pregnant, and had to leave their husband home in their country. And that's what we're facing. And we, Ukraine, Moldova should be candidate countries. These people deserve respect and our support. Thank you. Uh, I give the floor next uh, to Ms. Tanya Fayon for one minute. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I didn't imagine I would ever stand here on this stage and uh, state, stop the war in Ukraine. Those who advocate uh, for war, suppress freedom, the rule of law and human rights uh, must be stopped. Nationalistic uh, autocrats also in Europe will be toppling democracies until we stop them. And Russia's conduct is threatening the post-war arrangements and security of the entire Europe, also exploiting the war in Ukraine for political purposes and profit is a disgrace. Only unity and the swift response of Western democracies is uh, giving us hope. We Slovenians uh, still carry a vivid and painful memory of the bloody Bal Balkan Wars, and we want peace. Therefore. There will be a large rally, rally in Slovenia today for peace. We have to help those affected by war. Uh, I thank everybody who is selflessly collecting and distributing aid to the refugees and to all people in distress. Not only today, but always. Every war ends at a negotiating table. It's absurd that, uh, therefore, bloodbath, destruction and uh, suffering ever happen in the first place. We should do everything in our power that peace is achieved through the power of international law and words and not due to the argument of force. Thank you. Uzakovs for one minute. Distinguished Madam President, dear colleagues, I will speak Latvian today, but being myself an ethnic Russian, I would like to try to address Russians in Russia and in Europe as well. Thank you very much indeed. We see this war against Ukraine and we see that Russia should be ashamed. But Russians are protesting. And in Europe, there are a lot of protests as well. And a lot of Russian speakers in Europe, they are taking part in these protests as well. Being Russian isn't a shame. But but it's difficult to uh, justify what's happening in Kharkiv. We need to do more in Europe. 
we need to give the EU the chance to become an EU member as quickly as possible. And now in Russian. Pilsoni un prezidenti, ka jūs esat mūsē. Mēs esam pret Kremli, mēs esam... Well, we are against the Kremlin, but we're not against the Russian people. And it's important for us to say no to this criminal war in Ukraine. Important debate for this House. Uh, I invite on behalf of the Commission Vice President Sevcevic to take the floor. Madam President, uh, Honorable High Representative, uh, my dear colleague uh, Commissioner McGuinness, Honorable Members of the European Parliament, but first and foremost, dear Ukrainians, Shanovni Ukrainians. I have to say that I never seen a debate in European Parliament charged with so much emotions, solidarity and a sense of common European belonging. As you know, we come from different countries, from different uh, political families, but uh, we are discussing today an attack against the most fundamental European values that we all share. And therefore, today, we are all Ukrainians. Sigodni mivsi Ukrainci. Because the people of Ukraine are fighting for our values. They are fighting for our freedom and they are fighting for everything we believe in. For Europe as we know it, for Europe as we treasure it. And we will need the same unity as we felt this afternoon in this house in the days weeks and months ahead. It's clear that Kremlin has failed in its goal to crush Ukraine. It failed to break spirit of brave Ukrainians. It failed to divide or scare Europe. On the contrary, bravery and courage of all Ukrainians and calm and determined leadership of President Zelensky and his government energize not only Ukraine and Ukrainians, but the whole Europe, all democracies, and I believe every peace-loving human being in the world. Mr. President Zelensky, we have been working together to reform Ukraine. We have been working together on energy security, on energy independence. And we will be working together to build strong, democratic uh, Ukraine. Mr. President, uh, you ask us uh, to do proof that we are with you. And I would like to respond to you, we are. We will make sure that the sanctions are vigorously applied, and not only on Russia, but also on Belarus. We will do our utmost to supply you with everything you need. And we will be with you to rebuild your beautiful country after your victory. Nobody in Europe can doubt today that the people that stand up so bravely for our European values belongs uh, in our European family. And therefore, I want to reassure you that as we welcome your women and children in Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania and other European countries, that in the same warm, receptive way, we will open our arms to Ukraine in our common house of peace, democracy and prosperity called Europe. Slava Ukraine. Thank you very much, Vice President Sefcovic. And now, on behalf of the Council, I invite High Representative Borrell to take the floor. Señora Presidenta, Querido comisario, señoras y señor President, Commissioner, members, following this aggression in Ukraine, Russia is reaching a crucial juncture in its post-Soviet existence. 
Russia has come to the end of an era in its relations with the EU. The Minsk agreements are now a thing of the past. Putin has done away with them. They were not perfect. They arose at a point in time when we needed a ceasefire in a previous conflict. Nonetheless, those agreements guaranteed Ukrainian territorial integrity and respect for those agreements, which is now inconceivable, was something that led us on a path towards a normalization of diplomatic relations between Russia and the EU. That is now inconceivable. And this is why I'm saying that Russia has now reached a turning point in terms of its post-Soviet existence. This awful conflict can only lead to a positive outcome of a return of Russia to the fold of respect for fundamental principles. This is the opportunity which we have in the EU. We need to seize this opportunity to put forward mechanisms and treaties that will ensure that there are mechanisms in place for ensuring security. Stronger mechanisms in place that will allow us to be very vigilant about uh, their implementation. In the enthusiasm of a parliamentary session, one can forget that the path of dialogue, the path of speaking and listening to one another, is at the heart of what we do in Europe. We should not forget that. We are not a military body. We're not declaring war on anyone. We've actually turned our back on war as a solution, as a way to resolve conflicts. What we're doing is standing alongside a victim of an aggression, and we are mobilizing all of our diplomatic resources in order to ensure that we can safeguard the security of Europe, but also in order to find a solution to the conflict. Because there are necessary and inevitable sanctions, yes, but above and beyond that, we need solutions. Sanctions will hit, and are indeed already hitting, the Russian economy. And Putin cannot claim ignorance of that. He had warnings, President von der Leyen, the President of Council, have said on numerous occasions sanctions will impose a very high price and that is now going to happen. The ruble has lost 40% of its value. Almost half of the currency reserves of uh, Russia will be beyond reach with a significant impact on the economy. There's a threat of default So taking a few banks out of SWIFT is child's play compared to this. Because if you look at the figures, Russia had been preparing for some time to face a situation such as this, and it had been moving its dollar and euro reserves out into yuan, into yuan uh, renminbi, and gold. So they're moving out of dollars and euros, less than 40% of their total reserves now. But 40% is still significant. 135 million in gold. Uh, but uh, even if it's billions in, in gold, who, who's going to buy it? In order to sell it, you need a buyer. Sanctions are going to prevent the mobilization of these resources. So these financial measures are certainly unprecedented. The measures will go in the direction of a potential default which will have consequences for the whole financial system, for the global financial system. So don't, don't, don't minus the importance of what we have decided to do and what will follow. 
I want to stress that. And now we have to work diplomatically all over the world, reaching out all countries in order to build a state of the mind in order the aggressor being condemned. And on that, I can assure you, me as High Representative, all my colleagues, members of the Foreign Affairs Council, all our delegations, all our embassies will be strongly working in order to get a result on the vote of the General Assembly. This is the most important thing that we have to do right now. Because I repeat, this is an issue which belongs to the foreign and security policy, which is intergovernmental, and it's the member states who have to take the lead on this response and the diplomatic sphere. The second thing that has been discussing today, and is maybe the more important that uh, many of us could believe, is our dependency from the gas. The president has been saying all the time, we have to reduce this dependency. But I've been listening for the last 20 years that we have to decrease this dependency, and this dependency has been increasing during the last 20 years. So from now on, let's put we work in accordance with our saying, because we pay $700 million for the world for gas and oil and coal imports from Russia. And every year we import 200 billion meter, meter, cubic, met, sorry, cubic meters of gas. We have to increase renewables, President said, have renew hydrogen. But keep in mind that the amount of power in a country like Italy a year in renewables is less than half billion of meters cubic cubic meters. So we have in front of us a strong work to do. And we have to remain committed to it. And we have to explain to our people what does it mean. This is a good occasion to develop the best and most noble side of the political activity, which is pedagogy. That's the moment to do pedagogy. And I understand the enthusiasm and the approach of a Parliamentarian chamber in a moment like this. I've been parliamentarian as you many years, even president of this house. And I know that this is the moment to show enthusiasm and support. But then we have to go to act. And next time, when you discuss again the budget of the European Union, remember that we need resources for, for do what today we are doing with an intergovernmental fund that this parliament has never proved. Because it's not in, the, in your competences. Put more defense and security on your mindset. Stop discussing theology about uh, strategic autonomy. Call it the way you want, but we have to be more responsible. We have to take our responsibility more in our hands. We have to be strategically responsible. And this has nothing to do against weakening the transatlantic alliances, which, by the way, have been proven to be stronger than ever. And our unity with the transatlantic partners has been 100%. Nothing against weakening NATO, because we develop our capacities. We have to become a hard power. I know that the words may afraid someone, but hard power, I insist, is not just talking about military. Hard power is having a power to coerce, the power to influence the decisions of the others. And what we are doing on these measures is a lot of hard power. Be prepared for the answer. Be prepared for the consequences. Don't put all your strength in your mouth. Don't say nice things only. From now on, we have to be prepared to resist. We have to be prepared to act in the long term with a clear understanding of which are our challenges and our capacities. This is the moment for the European Union to discuss about what do we want to be, what we are, which are the limits 
of what we can do and what do we want to do in the future. And in order, in order to face the challenge of the future, there is a lot of things that we have to review. A lot of things about our procedures, our methods, putting more attention on our capacity to act than in the time that we spend on in internal discussions. What's happening today in Ukraine, remember me, Budapest in 56. I was nine years old, but I remember listening to the radio how the Russian chars were entering in Budapest. Would remember me, 88, the Praga Spring. I was an officer in the Spanish army then, and my unit was put into alert. I don't know why, because it was completely useless. On both cases, we did nothing, because we couldn't do anything. But from now on, we have to face a confrontation between us, democracies, people who believe on freedom, on multi-party system, where citizens choose their governments. When we live in a free market economy, trying to put together economic efficiency and social cohesion with the autocratic regimes, which are supporting themselves with a clique of people who take advantage of the system, while the great majority of the people don't improve their living conditions. All the war treasury that Putin is taking from our gas payments doesn't go to increase the well-being of the Russian people. It goes to make more powerful his war machine. To l'argent qu'on paye pour le gas. Everything which is being spent on Russian gas and other goods are not helping the people of Russia. That's just going into military expenditure by Russia. And I think very honestly that the time has come for Europe to think of itself. What do we actually want for the future? What do we want to be in the future? And I think we want to be something more than what we are now. That is the true challenge which we will have to face over the next few weeks, months and years. And that is why the Conference on the Future of Europe can play a very important role. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, High Representative. Uh, that concludes the debate. The vote is already open and will be open until quarter past four. And I now invite all the colleagues. There are as many people uh, in the Esplanade waiting for us to address them. Looking forward to that. Thank you very much.